This is the FlipNerd.com Expert Real Estate Investing Show, the show for real estate investors. Whether you're a veteran or brand new, I'm your host, Mike Hambright, and each week I bring you a new expert guest that will share their knowledge and lessons with you. If you're excited about real estate investing, believe in personal responsibility, and taking control of your life and financial destiny, you're in the right place. This is episode number 377, and my guest today is Brian Mira. Brian and I get asked all the time when the next market will take its downturn. Well, we don't have a crystal ball, and we don't know exactly when it's coming, but we know that it is coming. The truth is, you need to be preparing for it right now. Now, that doesn't mean you should be sitting on the sidelines to wait for it, as it's always a great time to be a real estate investor if you buy right. There are different strategies you can play in up and down markets. But for those of us that lived through the last downturn, well, we learned a thing or two, and we're going to be ready to dominate when the next opportunity pops up. Today, we share our advice on the next market correction with you so we can help you prepare to thrive when it happens. Let's go ahead and get started. Please help me welcome Brian Mira to the show. Hey, Brian, welcome to the show, buddy. Good to be back, Mike. Good to be back. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. We were just talking uh, about being back. It's been two and a half years since you were on the show. So I'm hard to believe it's been that long, but uh, I'm excited to have you back again. You know, time flies, man. It's, it's yeah. like my mom said. She's like, the older you get, Brian, I was, you know, your mom always gives you this advice. <laughs> the older you get, the faster time will fly. You know, that's true. I just turned 43 uh, last week, so I, I guess I'm figuring out that's true. You know, mom yeah, was right. I'm, 40, I'm, I'm 43 as well, so I, I get it. It's funny, okay. too, when you have kids. I only have We only have one son. I know you've got a whole herd of kids, but when you have right. kids, right, when you have kids, you really see it, right? You're like, oh, my God, okay. I can't believe especially if you use like Facebook uh, memories or whatever they like show you something that happened like seven years ago. You're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that's been seven yeah, years. Right? Yeah, yeah. Awesome, my boys, they all, if you remember, I have triplets. I have three 14-year-old boys who next week are going to turn 15. They're all freshmen in high school and they all <laughs> are playing freshman football. So it's like, oh my God, how did I get wow. this old? So, And they're all going to get their driver's license in one more year, huh? Yeah. Between three cars, yeah, we won't talk about that yet. But yeah, yeah that's, that's, uh, I don't want to see any tears in your eye today in the show. So. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, um, and, for, and by the way, for those, uh, for those of you that, uh, that listen to this show, if you didn't know, we have another uh, show called REI Classroom, which is uh, they're usually short, like five, six-minute lessons, and Brian has helped us create a ton of those. So if you go to uh, if your iTunes or wherever you watch your podcast at Stitcher, just do a search for REI Classroom, and you'll see a whole bunch of other lessons that uh, Brian's helped us create. So. Cool, man. Well, hey, I'm excited to talk about uh, this today because we're going to talk a little bit about how to prepare for the next downturn. None of us know when it's coming, but we all know it is coming. Some of us that have been around for a long time that learned in the last one secretly are kind of looking forward to it, right? Because uh, we're, we're, we're going to be prepared, so we're going to talk about that today. So, uh, and, and you've been obviously very much involved in uh, short sales and loan modifications and things like that. So you, you learned a ton during the last t- downturn that's going to help a lot during the next downturn, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, and yeah. like you said, it's, you don't want to ever say I, – I'm very careful to tell people I'm not excited about it because that, of course, would sound horrible, right? Yeah, <laughs> <Once>. yeah. <laughs> excited but, from the opportunity in real estate though. Not We don't want anybody to get hurt. We don't want anybody right. to lose their house. We don't want any of that. But the fact is that's going to happen whether we want it to or not, right? You're right. Yeah. Exactly, man. Yeah. It's funny because uh, I'm sure people ask you all the time. People ask me because they assume, hey, you're really active. You know a bunch of people. Like, what's when's the market going to take a downturn? I'm like, I have no idea. But all you can do is kind of get ready for it, right? Well, we don't have an idea, but what we do have is data, right? Yeah. So if, it's really interesting. In fact, um, I, I do a lot of reading and online research, et cetera, on this, on this topic. And so – I think it was core logic. I'm not, I can't remember exactly where the source was, but basically what they did, Mike, is they had a chart, numerous charts and graphs showing housing prices and, and appreciation and, and interest rates and every, everything right there. Right. And they basically took that chart and then they took another chart with where we are today. So pre crash, say 10 years ago and where we are today. And they, they put them over top of each other. Mirror image. Really? We're like, we're, we're right. Yeah. I have to send it to you. We're right at the point where it's like, that's why a lot of people are saying in the next six to 18 months, something's going to go down. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. has that crystal ball. But if you just look at the data, it's, it's kind of telling a story. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey, before we jump into this topic, for those of you that, that don't know you that are watching right now, tell us a little bit about your background, my friend. 
Yeah, sure. So um, I got involved in the real estate business, the industry, in 2007. Um, coming off a divorce, I went out and got my real estate license where I lived. And so I live on the border. I'm originally from Jersey my whole life, but I moved across the bridge to um, Pennsylvania, right about 30 minutes outside of Philly. So I got licensed uh, as an agent with um, Keller Williams in Pennsylvania, New Jersey. And it's a funny story, Mike. So I, I don't know if you ever remember me telling you this, but when you're a new agent, what do you do for leads? How do you, how do you get your first listing, right? You know, if none of your friends and family are going to list, like, what do you do? So an inner office email came out. I'll never forget. I said, hey, I have a listing. Um, I don't want it. Who wants it? You know, just pay me a small referral, whatever. And it came out three times. So on the third go around, I'm like, I was insecure. I didn't know what to do. So what I said, I'll take it, raise my hand, right? Well, it turns out it was a short sale. So there's a reason looking back that over 200 agents didn't want any part of it, right? Because there's nothing short about a short sale. Right. But me being Steve, I didn't know any better. So that's my background in that I did my very first deal as an agent, as a listing agent. It took me nine months. I got it done. But over the course of the next two years, I really became the go-to guy for short sales just because I was doing something most people didn't want to do. Yeah. And I figured yeah. out like anything, yeah. it's, uh, it's just a matter of having systems and the right people in place. Learning how to do negotiation, learning how to properly submit the paperwork, and all the different steps to a short sale, and uh, and that's what I did for two years. Now, right during that time, so if you remember, and depending on who you talk to, a lot of people will say April, May of two thousand eight was the official crash, but it kind of obviously didn't happen overnight, right? Right. It happened over time, um, and in different times in different parts of the country too, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's the other thing. You see, it's not like a day it happened on this day. No. Right. But. What's interesting, though, is if you go back, Mike, so for those two years, people started flipping short sales, the A to B, B to C flips, remember? Yeah. Same day closings. You know, literally, you're going the title escrow and you're buying here and you're selling here within minutes, right? Yep. And making a profit. So as an agent, I would be making a few thousand dollars for the deal and I'd see somebody flip it and make 40, 50, 80, 100 grand. Mm. <laughs> whoa, whoa, I, I, how do I learn how to be that guy, that girl, right? I got right. to learn how to invest. And uh, that's kind of what started me into the investing world, you yeah. know? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and so, you know, what did you learn during the last downturn? I mean, obviously, hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? But in the real estate business, we know for the most part that that's going to come back around at some point. We go through cycles, right? So we don't know when exactly. It sounds like uh, you've got your ear to the ground a little more than I do in terms of timing of what's going on, looking at the data. But uh, what are some of the main things you learned last time that you that kind of helped you for the next time that we go through that? A lot of things, man. It's just a few things that come to mind. So, you know, I always tell people short sales will never go away. I mean, I'm still doing them now, right? I just picked up two new ones last week. Now, like you said, real estate, it, it's very particular to the market. So because I'm Jersey's like right there, New Jersey is still leading the nation in foreclosures, right? Yeah. There's a lot of reasons for that. There's a very long time frame. It's, it's a judicial state. And so there's a backlog and all that. But that that's a different talk for another day. Sure. The point is, it's still very heavy you know, in concentration of your bank owned homes, your foreclosures, your pre foreclosures, but your short sales, et cetera. And there's other areas too. Like Houston actually has a lot of them right now that this was even before, you know, the events that happened. Okay. But so you just have to know your market, right? But what I tell people all the time is that what's what the, what the reality is, is that certain things are never going to change. You know, people are never going to stop, unfortunately, getting divorces, getting sick, cancer, right? right? Uh, losing their job. I mean, life changes. And then all of a sudden the mortgage can't get paid and people, they lose their home. Right. And so to be able to come in and do a short sale is uh, it's it's never going to change, you know? And I think that's where I, where I really realized is that I have a model that it's, it's recession proof. And like you said, if things, when things do take a turn again, that just goes up. Right. Because now the cycle, you know, continues. But as far as preparing, I, I think that what one thing people can understand is the process of a distressed market. You know, why do people lose their homes and what are the choices with a bank? Most people don't understand that to this day, banks, for the most part, truly don't want to foreclose. Right. You know, when they foreclose on a home, a lot of people don't understand the concept of how banks make their money in the sense that with a fractional reserve banking system, they can lend out on a 10 to 1 ratio. So for every $100,000 in deposits, they can lend out a million dollars, right? 10 to 1. Well, what happens when you have to take back an asset and sell it as a bank-owned home? That money is not in play. Right. And so depending on the type of you know institution and you know bank, if you will – if they have a certain amount of that debt, they're actually going to lose the ability to lend further money. Right, yeah. And yeah. So there's a lot of reasons that they don't want the house. And so if presented properly to them to sell short, to take a short sale to an investor like one of us, it's what they want to do. But unfortunately, people just don't know how to approach the bank the right way. Right. So for the agents out there, I'm not an agent. I'm uh, 
haven't been, never will be. I don't really need it, right? But there were, and I'm not, not right. saying anything bad about agents. Every time I make like an agent like jab, I always have to say, but my wife is an agent in case somebody's offended. I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> I don't know family. if that helps. I don't know if that gives me permission to, you know, I'm not, I'm not making a jab. I just don't really need to be. But yeah. so the question is, is um, as you know, there were guys like you that were truly became experts. And then at one point, every real estate agent effectively said, I'm a short sale expert. Yeah. But we both know that they weren't. And so what will happen in the next downturn? Because, you know, markets tend to get more efficient. Next time there truly will be some experts that are uh, ready to take this on and a lot of agents that are like you were when you started. Like, ah, this sounds like it's uh, going to be a little more work, but I'll take it on because I need the business or whatever are going to do that. W what efficiencies do you see happening there with agents or even investors that work with agents uh, to pull this off that will be kind of – you know, a little more uh, finely tuned than it was last time around. Are you looking to change your life through real estate investing? If you're interested in either getting started or taking your business to the next level, please check out FlipNerd's private program at theinvestormachine.com. This is the most robust real estate investor coaching, networking, and mastermind on the planet and designed for your success. If you're ready to roll up your sleeves, ready to take personal responsibility for your own success, and ready to dive into a world-class instructional coaching program that provides you step-by-step -step instruction to help you achieve financial freedom, then you should apply today. Spaces are limited, and candidates are only considered after an application and interview process. Our 12-month investor program is unparalleled. Think you might be a fit? Learn more today at theinvestormachine.com. You know, a little more uh, finely tuned than it was last time around. A little more streamlined, right? Yeah, yeah. So a couple things. I think that um, a good tip for any agent out there, and I still am an agent, by the way. Um, I, it's in referral status. So I don't I – mean, I keep it active so just because I don't want to let it go, right? Right, right. But I don't, obviously, I don't list homes anymore and certainly wouldn't compete with the agents I work with because my primary way of getting business for, throughout all the years uh, – and so when I created my course, remember I created the course on how to flip yeah, short yeah. So one of the training modules was basically um, what I called the realtor referral method. And so to this day, I've never done a mailing, Mike. I, I've never knocked on doors. And I've never done any of the traditional marketing that most real estate investors do yeah. because I've always relied on real estate agents for realtors to bring me the deal. Hmm. So my value proposition to them was very simple. Hey, listen, even though I'm an agent, I will do all the heavy lifting. Most agents, regardless of if they're good at it or not, they don't want to spend all their time in front of a computer on a phone dealing with a bank pushing paperwork back and forth. So by having built a team of negotiators and attorneys and people that work for me, I have the ability to go to that agent and say, hey, look, you know, you'll never talk to the bank. This is my little slogan. And I'll never touch your commission. Like let you focus on what you do, which is go get another listing, short yeah. sell or not, and I will handle the back end, right? Okay. Which is what we always did. So Because you don't I have to be you, licensed. You don't have to be licensed to work a short seller. I don't know if that's different state by state, but generally you don't have to be licensed – to nego to try to work work through a short sale, right? You don't, but here now now that's that's a very interesting point. So certain states like New Jersey have very strict laws on the books, these consumer protection laws. Okay. And what they basically state, and it's a big misunderstanding in that you can't negotiate a debt unless you're a certified debt counselor, you're this, you're that, you're an attorney, you're a mortgage broker, a neighbor, right, a real estate broker. Yeah. But there's a there's a there's a little footnote there. If you are charging the distressed seller. So if you never charge them any money, you can do it. You understand? Because now in the United States of America, there is no law on the books that prevents you from negotiating the best possible price for your own purchase. We're okay. the buyer. Yeah. And we, we full disclose who we are, what our intentions are. And so as long as you never charge the seller, which a lot of people did and frankly got in trouble for. Yeah. It might remember there was all these companies. Well, the agent commission is going not going to you either. It's going to them, well, right? So yeah. Correct. So yeah. the only profit I make is when I buy and resell the home, which is yep. what investors do. Yeah. You know? That's cool. That That's cool. Yeah. That's uh, that's good to know. Yeah. So yeah. part two to that question and what I think that agents and investors alike could do is, you know, there's always people, as we mentioned before, that are going to, you know, fall on hard times and they're going to get in trouble. Right. Right. And even though uh, in many, if not, dare I say most parts of the nation, the equity has come back, there's been rapid appreciation of value. The thing that people sometimes I think forget or don't really understand is that a lot of people have really heavily been relying on these FHA loans, right? You're only putting down three and a half percent, sometimes with a gift letter, right? So 
the actual equity in a property really isn't isn't it's not where people think it is. And so if you're right on that line, and a lot of times people will say, well, I owe 250 and it's worth 250 or I owe 240 but what about the closing costs, right? What about 6% to the realtor and the other two, three, four, depending on where you live, transfer right. tax, all that stuff. So if you're selling a $300,000 house and you don't, and you're right, you owe three and it's worth three, well, do you have 30 grand to bring to the table? Because if not, you can't do the deal, which means somebody's going to have to get cut short and there's another short sale. So it's not always these situations where, well, it's, you know, I owe 300, it's only worth two, which we saw obviously during the crash. Right. But, so even, what I'm saying, though, Mike, is that even though the values have come back as they have, there's so many people today right on that cusp where it, it's a very dangerous situation and by the way somebody like that what the first hookup, hiccup that happens in their life like their wife comes home and says that she's leaving right now there's a divorce situation or god forbid a child gets sick or something where they the, the income stops right or separation what do you do and, and that's what that's that's what people need to understand agents of life in that yeah. if you're marketing to the people who are in trouble and how do you know somebody's in trouble well, look most people go after the low-hanging fruit, right? They're going to wait for the Liz pendants, the public notice, which is generally when somebody's three or more months behind on the mortgage, right? Well, I always told people, why not get them beforehand? You know, there's data out there where you can actually reach out to people who are two, one, two, and three months behind on their mortgage payment. Right. There's yeah. list providers. You can sell that data. And mail so to before, them, or you could even, a lot of folks are cold calling now, right? Everything. So, in, yeah. uh, of course, they have to scrub it against the do not call registry. But everything I tell them from doing direct mail campaigns, which includes handwritten letters, postcards, yellow, it's all the standard stuff we know. Yep. Uh, phone calls, you know, where applicable and they actually you can call them. Door knocking, right? A lot of people are afraid, but one of the best ways to generate leads in that situation is to go knock on somebody's door. Yep. If they're not there, have some type of a you know, door hanger or something to leave behind. So all the traditional methods that most investors do, just targeting specifically people who are, you know, have fallen on hard times. And here's the thing. We've all been there, at least I know I have. Where you know you go, you miss a payment. You just money got jammed up, especially entrepreneurs, right? People self-employed, you just didn't have the money for your mortgage, so it went unpaid. But then, what do you do? You catch up the next month, right? So that doesn't mean they're losing the home. So we don't tell people generally if it's a one missed payment, a thirty day, leave that alone. But when it hits sixty days and someone's two months behind on their mortgage payment, they're heading towards trouble. Yeah, because a lot of times with these banks, they won't allow you to catch up if you're two months or more behind. In other words, you can't just send in one payment now like have a rolling 60 or 90, you have to catch up on all the back payments and then all the fees and everything else. And we found that most people just can't do that. Yeah, it starts to kind of rub salt in the wound ultimately, right? Snowballs out of control, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's it's crazy. I mean, I, I feel, sometimes I forget how blessed I am, but when I when I look back at some people, I mean, some people, true, a lot, truthfully, if you look start to look at stats on uh, kind of wealth in America or how much money people have, I mean, that, I has, I don't, I'm not going to say these stats right, but like, Fifty percent of Americans have less than fifty thousand dollars, or less than a less than a less than a thousand dollars in savings. I think something like most people truly are living check to check, and so something pops up, you get behind on something, it's it snowballs pretty fast. Yeah, it really does. Yeah, and you know, <clears throat> one of the other things, the the situation net, it's not even necessarily for the people, and I know we were talking about this before, who have no equity, right? It's for people who also have equity, and dare I say, high equity which is a new model that I know we were discussing that I'm doing now, which is the high equity pre-foreclosures. Um, so what we do, Mike, is we basically will target people who are up for auction. And it's so funny. It's such a different twist from what we used to do. We used to tell people if they would bring us a lead or a deal, hey, if there's an auction date, it's too late. Why? Because let's think about it. Generally, the bank is getting ready to auction it off. And we'll get, we would get calls, hey, my house is going up for auction next Tuesday. I'm like, dude, you waited a little right, bit Right, right. For help, You're like, like why? Because at that point, an investor-based offer, which is going to obviously not be full retail value, right? Not full market. They're not going to stop an auction for that for an investor offer. When you start prior to them, when there's no auction set, of course they're going to entertain it more times than not. When the auction set is generally too late, what happens is my attorneys, my staff, my everybody have to scramble for a deal that probably wouldn't go through. Yeah. Now contrast that with what we're doing with the high equity stuff. We are actually look for people who are on the auction block next week, next month. What we're doing is we're, we're looking for people that have 150000 plus in equity, reaching out to them saying, listen, do you want to stay in your home? What do you mean? Well, we're going to buy – we're going to pay off your mortgage in full. A couple things happen there. They're not going to – there's no short sale. The bank didn't take a haircut. So when we contact the bank and saying, oh, yeah, we're going to pay you in full. We'd like you to postpone you know, this auction. Of course they do because right. they're getting all their money. Right. Now, here's the best part. Here's why I'm doing what I'm doing. 
And first of all, I have to tell you, you would be surprised at the amount of people whose houses are up for auction who have 150000 plus in equity and they're losing. Now, what happens to that equity? It's gone. It's, it, it, they lose it, right? Right. Brian, why wouldn't they sell? Why wouldn't they list it with an agent? Two reasons. A lot of times people, when they fall in hard times, they, put, they bury their head in the sand. Let's say it's some executive and he's making really good money, right? And he loses his job, but he's got a four, five, six thousand dollar house house payment every month. Can't pay it anymore. Looking for the job, hoping it's going to turn around, right? Trying to get that loan modification, which yeah. generally doesn't go through because now there's no income, right? So all these different factors don't want to take the kids out of school. We generally see the situation most with families. You know, you're barbecuing with the neighbors in the summer. Halloween's coming up. You're going to go with the kids in the neighborhood. You've made friends with your neighbors. You want to leave your house? That's why they don't list it because they're they're waiting to the very last minute to hope something turns around. Right. So when they get that call from an investor like us who has access to private capital to actually keep them in their home, it's a win-win situation. And we take a small portion of the equity. We certainly let them retain the high majority of it. Hmm. We just take a small portion of it as our fee. But what's cool about that, Mike, and, and for me, what, what's so personally rewarding, every short sale I've ever done, the bank makes them leave. Right. They got out. You can't lease it back to them and say, okay, I bought it now. You're going to be my tenant. You stay here. Bank's like, no, 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 no. They have to leave. And it's in every approval letter and affidavit. Wow. You can't keep it there because that's called fraud, right? If you yeah. violate the approval. So they have to leave. So although we've done as a company over all these years, over a thousand deals, every time, Mike, they had to get out. Right. And, but they don't want to leave. So the folks stay in their house in this model. You keep some equity. And then how, when do you get paid? When do you get to cash so, in on that? It's really interesting, the model we've created. So what we do, and we perfected this with over 300 deals in one county alone in New Jersey. So it's a model that we're rolling out. But So we use private capital. This isn't for a bank loan, a hard money loan. This is private investors. You know, you take the average guy or girl out there and they have money in a 401k. What are they making? Three, four, five percent. Single mm -hmm. digits, right? yeah. low generally. Or worse yet, somebody has their money in a CD making, you know, one percent a year. Right. And we should, how would you like a 10, 10 to 12 percent return on your money secured by real estate? It's the standard pitch for private money, but it works because, see, a lot of these private investors and private lenders are a little hesitant to lend on fix and flip. Well, what if it goes over contract, over budget? What if the contractor runs off with the money? What if, what if, what if you can't sell all this stuff? In this model, there is no what if. We're keeping a family in the home, and you get the deed as the investor. So yeah. you want 10 to 12 percent. Now, here's where this works. It's two-year money. So 18 months into it. Now, remember, we're leasing the house back to them, Okay. Yeah, they don't own it, right? Because then you you you, you would nope. you'd get. Uh, I mean, not that you don't necessarily want them to own it, but the problem is, is if you have to go through a foreclosure again in a judicial state, you Correct. could get you could get you could get screwed in a hurry. I'll take I'll take it another step. You ready for this? We yeah. thought about. This. Not only do they not own it, right? They're staying there, but they're not tenants either. What do you mean? Well, there's no lease because with a the lease they have rights. We use a U and O, a use and occupancy agreement. So if should something. <laughs> okay. So. So should something go wrong, we could change the locks that day. There's no court. Wow. So a lot of landlords out there just ears perked up when I said that because it's a, it's a brilliant model. Now, I can tell you <laughs> that over 300 test cases, 303 to be exact, we've only had to do that one time. Yeah. These are people, they, you saved their life. Mike. Right, right. You came in and they're, they're not going to screw you. Trust right. me. They, they, they are very appreciative. And here's the end game. Let me explain this. Two years later, we will take them to a bank. A lot of times the bank that they actually were getting foreclosed on and get them a new mortgage. How do they do that? Well, because it's actually a refinance. So what we do is six months prior, 18 months in, we will do a quick clean deed, put it back in their name. So now they're seasoning. So they refinance and take out the private investor. Wow. So they refinance the very same house. Correct. Yeah. Wow. And they get on it back and now they own it again. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about what, what did you learn during the last crash? Like what did you, what are some keys? Actually, not just you. I mean, share some ideas of people that are listening of what you learned that they can use next time around. So we talked about a few things already. One thing would be the targeting, right? Really learning where to go, you know, like they always say, I think it's that Wayne Gretzky uh, quote, you know, you skate to where the puck's going to be, right? right? Not where it is. And so understanding that something will happen, again, none of us have a crystal ball and know when, but we know there will be, and, and, and that's the other thing too. People, you know, it's either, there's generally two types of people for the most part. There's the people who think, ah, oh, it's never going to happen again, right? Which is, they're delusional. Because if you track real estate, at least over the last 100 years, there's been a correction of some degree every 8 to 10 years. And again, if you track the last one back to April or give or take the spring of you know 2008, well, we're coming up with no, November is when? Wednesday? So you know yeah. we're coming at a time where it's like, wow, six months, we're at the 10-year mark. So the point is this. 
you have the people who are in complete denial, and then you have the other people who think that the, the world's going to end and we should all be building bunkers underground, right? Right. I, I think there's going to be a correction, right? Not necessarily a crash, but something will happen. And to know that's going to happen, to position yourself as an investor, as an agent, to be that go-to guy, that go-to girl who has their finger on the pulse. How do you do that? You know, you stay educated. So some of the few things that I could share with your audience here that to keep their finger on the pulse. In real estate in general, I'm going to give you a few resources. These are all free, by the way. You would want to subscribe to a daily email that you get. One of them is called dsnews.com. It stands for distressedservicingnews.com, dsnews.com. They have a paid version, but you can get a daily email digest and update. Every day, you get an email. And that's specifically on the distressed market. So how do you prepare for the distressed market? You watch and follow the current trends, and you're getting emails with numerous articles every day to literally keep your finger on the pulse. Another really good one that I like is Housing Wire. I don't know if I'm sure you're familiar with that. And they send out two emails a day. They have a morning and an afternoon um, recap. So housingwire.com. These are just a couple different resources that people can – You know, my old thing I always did when I ran the coaching program, I would train investors. I said, look – Keep your finger on the pulse. Wake up. You're having your coffee. Read your emails. You know, just go through. Keep see what's going on. Yep. So you certainly will know as things start to change, right? Yep, absolutely. Uh, saw a few articles recently about some values and longer um, days on market in certain key areas of, of California. Now that's causing some quote experts to kind of say, "Oh, could could we be looking at the start of something here?" But right. you know, like I said, it's good. Reading, if you're not if you're not in California, California is always uh, is is usually the first to the party. So. When stuff starts yeah. to happen in California, if you live somewhere else, you could say, ah, this is happening there. You start to yeah. expect that to happen maybe in the months ahead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The sand, they follow the sand states, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, man. So what can people do to prepare for uh, taking advantage of this stuff next time? We talked about a couple of things that we learned, but if, if, if folks are newer especially, they ha- maybe they weren't even – some people that are listening right now didn't even go through that cycle. What are some things that they can do right now to kind of get prepared for taking it, taking advantage? I'm not saying taking advantage of anybody, but taking advantage of the opportunity that is going to come. You know, I, I it's funny because it, it seems like everybody you talk to, everybody has a conflicting opinion anymore about anything, I guess, really politics, you name it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so there's two different schools of thought with that. A lot of people believe that in acquiring as much inventory as possible, specifically more for your long term buy and holds. Right. So acquiring this inventory. So if things go down, guess what? Uh, if you don't sell, it doesn't matter, right? And people right. are always going to need a place to live. And I can tell you that by working with hundreds, Mike, hundreds of, if not thousands of investors over all these years, specifically during the crash, meaning starting when I was an agent and the first few years as an investor, it, it was literally split 50-50 because the people who sold, sold at a loss or they just let it go. And then they come to me and say, hey, I need to do a short sale. Now, a lot of times, don't get me wrong, if tenants moved out and they didn't want to put somebody out or couldn't put somebody back in there, there were reasons for that. And I understand, yeah. right? There, I didn't really see personally a lot of sh- what they call strategic defaults. But at the same time, the people who wrote it out, they did just fine because look where they are today. Right. Maybe if you had planned properly for your certain periods or percentages of vacancy. And again, it, it, it comes down to being a knowledge and educated investor, right? Yeah. Knowledgeable yeah. investor. So it really – I know guys to this day that they're very transactional, so all they want to do is they want to continue wholesaling houses. Nothing wrong with that. A buddy of mine in North Jersey made over four hundred grand last year wholesaling houses. Yep. So people think, oh, that's that's where you just your entry level wholesaling. Really, you, you you can do quite well. Sure. So, or maybe you're in that fix and flip mode, right? Now that's obviously where things are going to take a turn. If that's your whole business model, how can you one get prepared? Well, d- number one, it's like they say, don't have all your eggs in one basket. And if you're just doing fix and flips and the market takes a, a really steep turn, well, you're probably going to be in trouble. Yeah, yeah you get stung. What's yeah, it's funny. I know people uh, – back to your comment on people that were holding. So I know some people that held on to properties, and they were they were upside down. Yeah. I have uh, one friend in particular that uh, uh, had about 30 or 40 properties. He was upside down on all of them. and yeah. uh, But he didn't want to – just like he, just, he didn't want to file bankruptcy. He just wanted to like suck it up, you know. And uh, so the properties didn't cash flow that well. Uh, lost money in some years, but he hung on. And then uh, this is in, this is in a market. This is in Denver, which just has blown up over the last few years. You know, so by the fact that he held on to that, I mean he he made a killing. You know, yeah. yeah. It's it's, it's kind of like the stock market. You know, I mean, I mean, it yeah. doesn't. I mean, unless you're what what's your strategy? You know, are you in this for the long term? You know, I always tell people, you know, are you running a sprint or a marathon here? Yeah. I made the decision, you know, back then to become a real estate investor and go full time. I knew this was something I was going to do the rest of my life. It wasn't a little 
thing just to do on the side or I wasn't just going to do one or two houses a year. I knew if I was – like everything in my life, if I was going in, I was going all in and never getting out. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah, some of the lessons I learned are um, you know, just make sure you get financing lined up because a lot of – you know. I don't know about you. I, I, I'm sure that you're the same way. You get like – I don't know how active you are on LinkedIn. Are you very active on LinkedIn? You know, it's so funny you say that. I just – I think I'm just about to cross the 10,000 okay. uh, quote, whatever they call it, contact profile, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know how it grew this big. I mean I always yeah. accept – So I would, and, and it tends to like – it serves up the people that I guess are of interest to you. Like they're in real estate, right? They're in right. mortgage bank. So, you know, which is really pretty cool. Um but I, I'm not as active as I should be. I'll put yeah, a yeah. post once. Well, that's okay. I'm not. I'm, I'm kind of like you. I, it's on autopilot. It's you know. There was a time when I used it like ten years ago, mo- mostly before I got into real estate investing, actually, and it's just blown up over the last few years. But honestly, I get a million requests. I, honestly, I probably get a couple dozen requests a day, and yeah. it's like seventy five percent of them are they they say they're some sort of lender. Like everybody and their brother's a lender now, right? They're all private money lenders and stuff. But you know, all those guys are going to go away first, like when when yeah. the market takes a downturn, right? But yeah. so you know, lending dries up. I when I, so I started in two thousand eight, and uh, you know, when we went to talk to banks or private lenders, I mean, they were they were they would say like, oh, we don't lend on real estate anymore. Check back with us in a year or two. You know, I mean, it was just like it dried up in a hurry. But I think it's important now. Fortunately, I had access to some private capital and. We started doing more and more of that, but I think that's one of the big lessons that I learned is uh, even if you're not doing a lot of fix and flipping, if you want to hold rentals or whatever, is just start to find those lenders now that have been around for a long time or that there's more of a relationship there. So if they back way out on on lending, they're looking for people like you that they know that might still be around, right? I think that's huge. That's a huge yeah. piece of advice. And one of the things I wrote down to say was I, all I wrote down on this little my little scratch pad for our call here was private lending. Yeah. I talked about that as it relates to the high equity pre-foreclosures, right? right. Well, specifically in the time of a crash or a correction or a downturn, there is not going to be any money. I saw We saw that. You understand? Yeah. All your hard money, your, your joker brokers, all these people out there, they're gone. <laughs> it, 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 it's over. And then banks aren't lending money. Not that we as investors like to go to banks anyway, but the point is the hard money, it's all going to go. Yeah. So about these people and, – and the people tend to forget. They talk about the crash – well, look what happened to the stock market. And do you know what happens with those people when, when they're taking losses like that? Where do they want to park their money? Where do most of them still want to park their money today, which is in real estate? Yeah. So if you have a stressed market and someone has that where they're making those single-digit returns and you could show them how to make a 10%, 12% return when everybody else is losing money yeah. because I tell – look, who, the one thing about housing we know, the price go up, the price go down, this, that. People always need a roof over their head. Yeah. And if you position yourself and, and play real-world monopoly – you're going to win. Yeah, and I think more, more when you, like you say, people start to pull their money out of the stock market and other places. And I think this has happened quite a bit over the last few years and will only continue is that I think people are just growing more and more uh, distrustful, distrustful, mistrustful, which one, I don't know which one of those is a word, about the stock market, right? It just feels like it's a shell game, right? So the thing is, is even if you're not over there picking out paint colors and stuff, which you don't want your lenders to do anyway – I think there's a lot of people that as they get older in life and as they get more and more tired of the stock market, that they just feel comfortable investing in something in their market that are more, is more local to them or somewhere nearby geographically because they know at least you know, they have first lien deed of trust on it. So they've got a real asset there. And if they ever wanted to go drive past it, they could. Right? People just feel more comfortable with that even, even though they may never drive past it. At least they know they can. That plus I, the fact that I, and how I've always positioned it when I've dealt with private lenders – specifically those that were new to utilizing their money to invest in real estate is that you get to become the bank. Yeah. Like you are the bank. Right. Right. Like, think about that. You're the bank. I mean, that, who doesn't want to be the bank? And so you're in a position, you have an equity stake because as investors, we're not going to present them a deal that exceeds a certain percentage of the fair market value. So should something go wrong, you have a nice cushion for your money yeah. regardless. Right. So I think that you know people talk all the time about raising private capital and raising private funds, and it's so hard. It's not hard. You just have to learn how to, how to have the right conversations with people to give them the facts, show them why it's such a secure investment, frankly, in my opinion, the best out there, yeah. and, uh, and that you're not going to have a problem raising private capital. But to get back to your point, that is one thing that people can do right away to prepare for that downturn. Have access to funding and capital. How many people listening to this, Mike, how many people have – whether it's a spouse, a parent, a very close friend, a relative who have money in a 401k. 
You know, one thing I, I'm really shocked about is people don't understand the natures of investing. They don't understand that you can convert a 401k to a self-directed vehicle. Right. Whether it's like a, you know, one second, <laughs> got somebody knocking on my window. Um, <laughs> they, they, they don't understand that, oh, well, you know, and if I take the money out, what about a loan? Because they just don't understand the, the dynamics of it, right? Right. And so to do a self-directed account, to really direct your own future, you you know, yeah, you're not giving it up. You're not. It's going to take a little bit more research on, on someone's end to get that comfort level. But us as investors, learning how to have those right conversations, showing the value of who we are and what we do, that's that's where it all works. I believe that's the magic right there. Yep, yep. And, you know, one of the things that I talk to people, I told you I just uh, led some live – I had some live events last week where people were asking, well, what's going to happen? When are we going to turn downturn? And, you know, one of the things that I think is powerful – is a powerful lesson if you haven't been through a few cycles. It's just to know that – you can make money as a real estate investor in up and down markets. You just yeah. have to shift your strategies, right? Like right now, when the, it's a seller's market, it, where I'm at in Dallas is on fire, you know, seller's market. And I do more selling activities. In fact, I'm, I'm about to start to sell off a few of my rentals here, some of my dogs that I never thought I would sell. Okay. But I can't believe how much I can get for them right now. I was like, I'm going to take advantage of where the market's at right now. And we do more instead of like wholesaling to traditional investors. I'm doing more of wholesaling on the MLS to – maybe end users or whatever, because I make more money doing that. And I think that'll pull back once the market pulls back. But when it's a seller's market, do more selling activities. When it's a buyer's market, do more buy buy and hold activities, right? And you yeah. just have to learn to ebb and flow. I mean, we do this in the stock market, right? You buy, I don't, I don't, I don't buy anything in the stock market anymore, but traditionally people buy, they think the market starts to get too hot or overheated, or it feels like it's starting to get risky and they sell off and then they move into something they think is less risky. And that's all you're doing is just kind of ebbing and flowing, trying to manage your return and risk. Right. Yeah. That's it, man. Yeah. Yeah. Real estate's no different, but sometimes we feel people start to act like it is like, Oh, it's a good time or a bad time. It's like, if you buy it right, it's always a good time. It's always a good time. And you always make it like anything. You make your money when you buy it, not when you sell. Right. If you're buying right, if you have the right strategies, if you're able to acquire the property at the right price, whether that's for that, you know, passive monthly income, you're going to do a quick turn, whatever the case may be. One thing also that a lot of people can focus on, specifically where I'm from, is really incorporating the Airbnb model, right? Yeah. You know, we'll always have a, it's a rental and it's a year long lease, right? And they pay every month. And well, and then you take it down a notch and you say, okay, well, how do we really maximize this space? It's a single family residence. How do you really maximize it? Because obviously, single family, you know, homes, the highest and best use is not really for a rental. We all know that. But there's ways you could change that. Student housing, right? If you live near a college or university, look into student housing. Um, if you're by a destination spot like we are, we, we have Philadelphia, we have New York. I mean there's all local areas, Atlantic City, the Jersey Shore, right? And to be able to understand that you can now do weekly rentals and a vacation rental, right? And then the next model, another notch would be nightly rentals, yeah. right? Literally charging by the night. And so it's just a different way to think about it, man. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <Love> well, <laughs> Brian, if folks want, if folks wanted to get a hold of you, learn more about some of the stuff you're working on, or they thought, man, that guy sounds so cool. How do I find uh, him? Where do they go? Where do they go? You make it sound cool on the show. That's cool. <laughs> really just my, my website, uh, Mike, just investor entourage dot com. Uh, the only thing from, from when I was selling the course, which I'm not selling it anymore, uh, on short sales, I had a, a deal analyzer. So for anybody who's interested in learning about how to analyze a potential short sale or maybe you think you don't need it now but you will in the future, it's one of the training modules from the course. So it's a video. It's a downloadable audio. It's a spreadsheet. A, you know, It's an actual calculator. So you can download that. I think it says right at the top of the page or whatever. It says put your email in for a free deal analyzer. Cool. And that's just uh, investorentourage.com. Awesome, uh, awesome. Well, we'll have links for that, DS News, Housing Wire, all those things we talked about down below the video here. And great to see you, my friend. Thanks for sharing with us today. Thanks for having me back, Mike. Uh, hopefully it won't be another two and a half years before I come back again. No, absolutely. <laughs> That's way too long, way too long. Right. Awesome. And again, guys, if you want to hear, Brian, Brian drops a ton of knowledge uh, out, whether it's on Facebook or on his website, or as I mentioned, uh, he's been involved in quite a few of our REI classroom lessons. So if you go to flipner.com, I don't even know what the link is. Somewhere on flipner.com, if you go slash shows, we have our different shows there, but also on iTunes and stuff, you can uh, check out REI classroom and Brian's uh done a number of lessons for that podcast. So everybody, this was episode number 377 with my buddy, Brian Mira. Appreciate you guys. Um, if you could go out to iTunes, Stitcher radio, Google play, wherever you watch your podcast at or listen at, uh, even YouTube and subscribe and give us a rating. We'd appreciate that. I, uh, I thrive on that stuff. I, I get energy from 
other people letting us know that they like what we're doing here because we're working hard to create 377 episodes of this one. Actually, the REI Classroom, uh, Brian, I think we had uh, uh, over 700 episodes of that one. So we've got a lot of shows. Yeah, we've been cranking them out for you guys out there. So appreciate you uh, giving us some love back. We'll see you on another upcoming episode. Everybody have a great week. Take care. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Flipner.com Investing Show. If you're not yet an elite member of Flipnerd, you're missing out. We have tons of great training, including a new detailed master class published each month and live training webinars with experts twice a month. Plus, you'll get access to all of our archives, where we already have a growing library of master classes and other training videos. Elite members also get membership in our incredible online mastermind group, where many of the top real estate investors from across the country including many of the hundreds of guests I've had on the show in the past, are already members. Whether you're brand new, looking to get started, or a veteran, you simply must join today. I promise you won't be disappointed. To learn more or join today, please visit flipnerd.com slash lab. That's flipnerd.com slash lab. See you on the next show.